Yes, people, Killer Keller here, Arts Arcade Piccadilly Circus for Kellervision. This is the Street Culture Podcast. This is where we talk to special guests who earthed their skills in street culture land and went stratospheric commercially into global success. Today we're speaking to a very special guest. Music production is the game, one half of a very successful dance duo collaborating with the likes of Jennifer Hudson, Emma Nikkei, JP Cooper, to name a few. All over the globe you'll know them. He goes by the name of Matt, Rack and Ruin, Gorgon City. <laughs> Matt, Rack and Ruin. Hello. Gorgon City, how are you? Yeah, good, good. <laughs> nice to see you. It's the first time, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. First time we've met and first time crossing paths. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Yes. It's a pleasure. And we've caught you on your downtime. Yeah, got a couple of days off um, in London after a crazy summer. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, this is like our sort of interim period between you know, Christmas and, like, getting stuff done in the studio, basically, mm-hmm. before, before uh, next year. Mm-hmm. I would imagine, and I'm only going on refer... I'm going to refer to Bono, that when a big tour finishes, he has to go to his own hotel and spend two weeks just declimatising before... <laughs> ahead of shouting at anybody and pulling people's hairs off at home, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think for us, it's just, just been such a sort of constant... Um, constant life of touring since we sort of started Gorgon City um, about 12 years ago. Um, we sort of got thrown sort of straight into it. I mean, we were both touring separately before um, doing our solo projects, mm-hmm. mainly just like in the UK. And this is Kai, FOMO. Yeah, Kai, FOMO, me, Rack and Ruin. I did so, other projects before as well. Like I've done a, a few different projects um, growing up. I was started off in sort of drum and bass um and yeah was really into hip-hop and stuff but you know i just sort of started producing drum and bass basically um and then moved on to sort of breaks and then recently more in the past sort of 10 15 years got more into sort of kind of house but baseline Mm -hmm. heavy house music which is kind of rooted in our love for drum and bass and sort of sub sub bass basically Mm -hmm. and that culture is what me and Kai grew up on like in London in and around London North London North London I'm from North London Kai's actually from just outside London he's from High Wycombe Ah, you got Um, the Berkshire crew yeah (laughs) Um, he used to come into London I think you know DJing going raving Mm -hmm. um, and we met um just on the DJ circuit, basically, he was foam. I was rock and ruin. He, he was playing. I think we met in Swansea in in Wales randomly in a nightclub. Nice, <laughs> nice. as you do. Sticky carpets, yeah, club ex- Eiffel back. Yeah, and stuff Cut like a that. Bottle of Glen's vodka. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know the ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Everyone's wondering what they're going to yeah. do in those scenarios. Yeah. <laughs> and so we just got on, basically. Really? And he just... Um, I was a big fan of his tunes, and he he was playing my tune. Basically, we were both kind of playing each other's tunes in our sets at <laughs> the time. And um, when we met, we just got on and we were like, oh, let's get in the studio next week. And I remember I had my studio still in my mum's house, like, and he came, drove over in his, like, uh, polo, old school mashup polo, with his computer strapped to his seat, to the passenger seat. And we sort of, like, put our two computers together in this really weird way. And, wow. And, like, he was using Reason, I was using Logic, and it's sort of like somehow we managed to make a couple of tunes out of that. Um, and it just, they were both, they were really interesting, sort of sounded really interesting, so we just went from there and just didn't stop. With reason comes logic. <laughs> yeah. huh? well, that's it's funny, crazy. now we both use Ableton. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Look at that>. <laughs> <laughs> Only when you're Ableton. <laughs> Sorry, this is Dad Joke Central. Um, Matt, I, I find those journeys really intriguing because it's almost like coulda, woulda, shoulda, if you hadn't, then what would have ever happened? And yeah. there is an alignment going on there, isn't there? Yeah, it's quite interesting. I think, like... At the time, it was quite a sort of... It was an underground scene, but it was very... Everyone kind of knew each other, like... And we all sort of... It was quite a small scene. At the time, I was doing lots of stuff in London. Places like... I don't know if you remember those raves, like Urban Nerds. Of course, yeah. like, we were part of... I was sort of friends with all the ATG lot, Mm -hmm. and we were doing Mm -hmm. raves. um, And the lineup. That's how I know your name. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I used to go... I think I used to go and see you play when I was, like, you know... Still at sixth form college, going to like kung fu and yeah, yeah, me too. Places like that, <laughs> so, yeah. you know, like it was, it was, um, it That's was amazing fantastic. growing up in London. Do you know what I mean? It was like it was, it was that having that sort of um, knowledge of, of of nightclubs and sort of like scenes and like learning about culture through going out, you know, with friends mm. and stuff. That's kind of got what got me really into like wanting to make the music itself, mm. you know. Um, but yeah, like the the scene at the time was interesting. We all we were all just 
trying to make tunes that you know were were fresh and mm. hadn't been done before and mm. using our kind of like drum and bass sort of techniques in the studio mm -hmm. but doing it kind of over house beats with and like a bit of kind of garagey jungly stuff mm -hmm. in there as well you mm -hmm. know and that's kind of that's kind of how we how it all kind of came together and yeah and i just i just happened to like his tunes you know what i mean mm -hmm. it was like i used to play that it got to a point where i was playing like three or four of his tunes in my set really and, you know what i mean and i was like i should probably meet this guy wow <laughs> you know I mean? really? and then yeah um he just it just like we just started making music and then we started working with vocalists and stuff um quite soon after that and it kind of changed the way we kind of produced music. It kind of gave us a new way of writing songs, mm. um, which we hadn't really done before. And we were just really kind of, we were just experimenting with it. Mm. Um, and yeah, luckily we got to work with some amazing artists and the rest is kind of in our back catalog, basically. Which is an incredible array of artistry collaborations. Yeah. Going back to what you were saying about the drum and bass era, the hip hop era, that's noted in a lot of your early, you know, Navigator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like the Don. I mean, you know, if that isn't in your catalogue, the, you know, <laughs> the man himself, you know, it's almost yeah. like a cosign, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was great working with him. I actually worked with him on my Rack and Ruin stuff a little bit as well. And then when we started Gorgon, we got in the studio with him and yeah, um, did that tune on the Crypt EP. That was, I think that was like our first EP mm. uh, as Gorgon City on mm -hmm. Black Butter Records. Black Butter Records. Black Butter Records, yeah. yeah that was, uh, I mean, Black Butter's still kind of going and morphing mm. into different things. Mm. I mean, that's how, it, that's how we started releasing music. I was managed by Henry, who, who started Black Butter with another guy called Ollie. Um, and then he managed me and Kai as well together. And then, right. So that sort of pre Gorgon City, as Gorgon City was formed, mm -hmm. he saw it was all part of Black Butter family, yeah, and yeah. all the other artists that we were working with were on Black Butter and Rudimental and all these singers and songwriters like M and E K and Sinead Harnett and Joel Compass, all these kind of like up and coming yeah. R and B singers and stuff, and then it kind of turned more into sort of the grime and. UK kind of like mm. rap stuff mm. more recently, but at the beginning it was more kind of a like an underground dance label. Yeah, and from, to my knowledge, it was that early Swedish house mafia kind of yeah. stream of that kind of world, but it was kind of more like UK, you mm. know, more UK sort of drum and bass and and like sort of funky get garage and stuff mm. like that. So yeah, so we're talking about 15, 16 years ago. Yeah, What's about that yeah thirteen. 13 years ago, yeah. probably, because we started Gorgon City properly in 2012. So that's 12 years ago. And then yeah. so before that, you know, I was racking around before that, basically. I'm going to ask you a really basic question. What, what does Gorgon City <laughs> signify? What's that? What's it mean? Yeah, a lot of people have asked us. It's bit, basically, we just started um, thinking that we needed a name for the project. At first, it was just Rack and Ruin and FOMO mm -hmm. as a collaboration. Mm -hmm. And then we thought we need, you know, we need some sort of like new identity. At the time, a lot of people were doing collaborations. A lot of like producers in our world were kind of like doing one-off collabs, but then turning them into like an EP mm -hmm. with a name. Mm -hmm. So like Toddler T and Red Light did Roller Express. There you go. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Like that kind of thing. And we were like, oh, let's just do something like that. Yeah, we yeah. weren't thinking, oh, let's <laughs> make a name and build a career out of it. Yeah, we yeah, just yeah. thought, let's do a one-off EP or maybe a couple of EPs and call it something. So yeah, we just we were using lots of bashment samples at the time, like we did the tune Navigator mm -hmm. and Ninja Man came up and Ninja Man's alter ego is Gorgon Don. That's how we first came really? up with the word Gorgon, yeah. And then wow. we were like, Gorgon what? And then we just like Googling like Gorgon City, like that nothing. sounds like a cheese, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, Gorgon Zola. <laughs> a lot of people say that. Yeah. People are say, is it not Gorgon Zola and Cathedral City put together? There's definitely a sponsor there. <laughs> <laughs> There's something there. So yeah, no, and it was just right. It, it, we realised that it was, um, you know, if you Google it, it's the only thing that comes up. Yeah, and which is that's so yeah. important, especially in today's climate. Yeah, yeah, especially with like producer names. There's just billions yeah. of producers now. Like to to sort of stand out, it's quite useful to have a kind of interesting name. Oh, like yeah, something, something they're all on different cool. platforms with the same name as someone else on another platform, but they're totally different lanes, different people. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, a lot of people did kind of think. Um, that it was more on the reggae tip because obviously you got that Gorgon word is quite yeah. prevalent in the sort of bashment and, yeah. and dancehall world. Yeah. And I remember meeting Rodigan at, at a festival once and he came on after me 
And he was like, oh, I thought you guys were reggae. <laughs> <laughs> really? And I was like, he was like, yeah, it was good though. And I was like, thank God. Um, but I was, he said, why are you, you know, he asked me, and I said, oh, because Ninja Man. And he was like, okay, cool. And then he started with a Ninja Man tune and he gave a little dedication. So it was like, you know, people, it has got that kind of like reference. Yes. But it's... Uh, Ground reference to But to yeah, to that world, but like... And obviously it's big bass lines and yeah. big drums and sort of jungle samples. I mean, we still to this day, like, m use a lot of old jungle samples mm. and sort of hip hop breaks and like, you know, just big sub bass, mm. bass lines. Like, that's still our sort of foundation when it comes to making music in the studio, mm. you know? You know, I find, I mean, a great uh, uh, um, act, production act with the similar sort of DNA, which I think, I, I think they often get overlooked as like basement jacks. Yeah, yeah. You know, for, sure. for all of that kind of melting pot that they brought from Brixton and all the different elements of, of genres. Yeah, for sure. Crazy. Yeah, we used, we actually worked with them a bit um, a few years ago. Um, did a remix for them in their studio. They used to have a studio in, in uh, King's Cross. Mm -hmm. And we went down there and it was just like working. Felix is a trip, working. man. Yeah, he's just like, <laughs> yeah. like the creation, the creativity behind him is yeah, just, yeah. It's it's wild, like, man. You could bottle that and I swear you could, you know. <laughs> yeah, be like a proper fizzy pop. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It, it, insane, but um, in a good way. But when you're in the studio, now sticking with that, you were, uh, you were into all different genres. You were into yeah. graffiti and such. Yeah. And, but production seemed to be your lane and yeah, it was yeah. more of a study for you, right? Yeah, I think DJing uh, was first, sort of records, vinyl, going out record shopping, trying to find those r tunes that you'd heard in the rave the week mm. before. That's where it all started. I think, you know, a couple of my friends that lived around the corner for me, they had, they had decks. Mm. And we started to, you know, just get into drum and bass and jungle, basically. Mm. And that, that sort of changed my whole perception because I'd, I'd never heard music like that before mm. and I wanted to know you know I, first of all I wanted to know like what it what it was called and how you got it yeah yeah yeah, yeah like yeah. where you got it from where is this artillery from? yeah where yeah. do you find these yeah, records yeah, 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 yeah. Like, and also how you make them mm. like because I was just like these sounds sound like they're from another planet yeah yeah, you know? yeah and so I was just so intrigued by you know how you how you create these sounds and obviously I knew about synthesizers and stuff but mm. I, they sounded different to what I'd heard on the radio yeah do you know what yeah I mean? And then I have found out about pirate radio and and you know started listening to Cool FM and um, Raw Mission and mm -hmm. Y2K and like mm -hmm. you know Deja Vu and all these like stations and I, and then yeah and then we started getting fake IDs and going raving basically. <laughs> and then, <laughs> this was a good sort of informative. That's age. What you could do. It. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you get away with you it. You can't do it now. Yeah, pre chip. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, so then yeah, then I then I really got into going to black market and going to vinyl addiction and in Camden and going to Know How Records and Reckless and all these record shops mm. and just digging and just trying to find those, trying to find like really new, interesting drum and bass and jungle that I liked, but mm. also trying to find those tunes that, you know, the DJs were all playing, but mm. you couldn't find them because they used to play dub plates for, for like a year yeah, yeah, yeah. before they'd come out. That, that's correct. That used to blow my mind. It'd be like a year until they yeah. actually dropped like on the shelves. And by the time they'd come out, you'd be like... Oh, you? It's rinsed. <laughs> yeah. I forgot about you. Yeah, yeah but you, you know. still buy it, obviously, because you've got to play at the house parties, you know what yeah. I mean? Because everyone wants to hear them. The dub plate culture was crazy. It was amazing. Wasn't it? It was so cool. I remember getting dub plates cut. Like, I remember doing it with my mate, and like, it was just such a sort of amazing, terrifying experience yeah. going to these mastering like mm. houses in, like, I can't remember where we I used to go to one called Liquid in, it was in like uh, Cricklewood or something. Really? And it was just like, yeah, just like dark, like mm. little, you know, studio with all these like older. I was so young, you mm. know, I was mm. like 17, you know. Yeah, you were younger. And like, you know, going in with a CD. I can't remember, yeah, we had CDs. We'd burn, we'd burn them on, we'd burn a WAV file onto CD, like highest quality, and then just give them that, and then they'd burn, yeah, yeah. cut it onto dub plate. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's spiritual, man. Still got those dub plates, and they still smell, that smell really? is just like. <sighs> It's so, it's oh, so, man. it's so special. It's a spiritual, it's, isn't it? You know, it's yeah, the closest yeah. thing you can come to music. Yeah, yeah. Seeing it being made as well, seeing it being cut in front of mm. you, just that one copy as well. Mm. Something about it just being one of them. Mm. You know, people used to, all the DJs, they do it every week. Yeah. Every week they'd go <laughs> and spend like, they spend hundreds of quid, yeah. like cutting dubs just to play that weekend. Yeah. And then they play them for a few weeks and then just get more cut, yeah. get off a different tune. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> that's why, you know, it was such a, such a different culture. It was almost like every tune was so valuable, mm. much more now, much more than now, because, 
now you can just you know get the download and yeah. just put it on a USB stick and you're and you're ready. But yeah. back then it was like you know you'd have that one dub or you'd have that one record and you know if if if, if that record if, you, if that record got stolen or or it got destroyed or you know you lost it, it was you couldn't really get them again because they'd sell out. That's the thing. <laughs> yeah, and they wouldn't really repress stuff no. unless it was like a big album like yeah. Ronnie Sy's album or you know a Goldie album or something. It wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't like. They were there forever. They'd no, that's be there right. for like a week or like even a day. It's kind of part of that disposable culture of music. Not disposable for the people that, you know, some, there was a method to it. If you're yeah. a producer or you're a super fan of, of the dub or, you know, you, you wanted that limited 12. But l for the long haul, you know, it was this, you know, white, you know, papered dub that no one, it's personal to you. You know what I mean? It's a very different way of, you know, receiving and, you know, consuming music, wasn't it? Yeah, definitely. It was sort of like, yeah, you know, you'd write your own little, like, tag on it as well. Yeah. It'd be like, you know, even if it was a white label as well, it wouldn't even have to be a dub plate. It could be just a white label that, you know, a big tune. Sometimes they'd only press them on white yeah. labels. You know, well, they would at first, wouldn't they? And then bit, if it, like, really popped off, they'd, like do the full release or yeah, something with a cover but, and everything yeah, yeah with a cover but sometimes you just yeah most of my records like they'd say like you know terrorist on them mm. or like you know planet dust or something it'd just yeah, be like yeah. some some white label with my my little like tag on it yeah. and it was that was it and that, that's so that's yours that's another thing like you know like if someone steals it you know it's yours because it's got your writing on it <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know yeah what I mean? totally because it's like yeah. and that's how it was and sometimes you'd you'd do a rave with your friends and you'd all end up mm. like messing up your records and someone would, you know, you'd steal your friends, he'd steal yours. I mean, I've still got records of my mates in my <laughs> collection <laughs> really? and they've got mine, you know. And it's, it's amazing. Like, yeah, still that way. I mean, I do, yeah, I do miss that, that sort of, um, that feeling of going record shopping mm. and like, you know, or go into the mastering house to, to get dubs cut. Yeah. Um, also just watching DJs play with, with dub plates was yeah. always exciting. Yeah. Because you could see them and you could see them taking out and being really careful with them because they're like plates, you and know. You know there's gold on there. Yeah, and also it's like delicate. You know that if they scratch it... It's game over. Yeah, or they spill a drink on it or something. Yeah. Or you Anything. drop it. Yeah. It's like, you know, nowadays it's like you don't see that. You just see someone twiddling a knob and pressing play or whatever it is. <sighs> um, it's a different... It's a different... It's a whole different art form, basically, mm. DJing now. Yeah, which it is, is. You know, it's, I'm not saying it's got worse... It's just different, um, yeah. but yeah, it's, I do miss. I, I've still got my deck, my vinyl decks. I still, I still play on them all the time. Really? Yeah, well, I try to when I'm at home. <laughs> when I'm at home, yeah. still got my records. A couple of drinks, you know. Yeah, get, yeah. Get the old girls going <laughs> yeah. again, right? <laughs> yeah, twelve tens never die. They never die. Um, yeah. Albeit the technology's moved forward progressively. When you're in, the, you know, in the presence of the studio and like how. How do you get ahead for, as in physical head, for setting up for a Gorgon City record? How do you... To produce it. Yeah. Because, um, like, if you're into different genres and, and such, yeah. although it's all one and the same in terms of, you know, process, you know, the, what you, you guys have managed to catalogue is, like, some huge commercial bangers. Like, is there a banger's head that you guys <laughs> have to put on or something? It's funny. It's, I was talking to my mate about that yesterday, about, like, you know... Basically, we're just we've just come out of our five album major label record deal. Ah. We've just completed it. Congratulations! So we've done five albums, wow. ten years <gasps> with Universal, and we're finally out of it. So we're now finally going to be able to go independent. Fantastic. For us, is like a it's something that we kind of never thought would happen in a way. Wow! Because when you sign a deal like that, you never think about the end of it. You just think about completing that next record, the next album, whatever. Mm. This is Positiva, right? Uh, yeah, so it sort of it, it was originally Virgin EMI, and then it sort of morphed into different labels as as the labels came and went. Right, oh, basically, yeah, yeah. If the artist stays there, but the labels change and the the A and Rs change and the the whole team changes, you know, we the the, the original people we signed with was Virgin EMI, a woman called Jade Richardson signed us. She oh, was, big up Jade! Yeah, yeah, she was the one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she was one of the reasons why we signed with with them mm -hmm. because she was so cool, and we had this amazing um, creative director called Dan Sanders, and she came up with the whole Medusa head for our Gorgon hmm. City out, our first album. Wow! She came up with it all, and th and then within about two years, or yeah, I think it was two years, they all just left, and we were stuck. We was you know, we, it's not like we were stuck you know, with a bad 
team or anything, but no. those original people just... Subdued. Gone, yeah. yeah. Like, so what you're like, do? what yeah. do we do now? And to a lot of our acts, I've, I know a lot of artists that over the years that's happened to, and then their, their project just sort of falls apart mm. because they haven't got that momentum anymore. They haven't got that backing in mm -hmm. the label. We were lucky in a way because I think we just had good management and we had good work ethic, me mm -hmm. and Kai, we just sort of just like cracked on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We didn't really care who was working with us or who we had on our team. We just mm -hmm. we just sort of believed in it and just sort of like, just went in on the, in the mm -hmm. studio and just didn't worry about the sort of business side of it ever. We never right. worried about, we, and like you said about putting like a hit brain on, mm -hmm. like we've never done that really. We just tried to have fun with it, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And like stay positive, never kind of like argued in the studio about like, directions or ideas or anything and just luckily worked with the right people I think and mm. all the tunes that have been our biggest over the years are the ones that have come like the easiest mm. so like Ready for Your Love with m &EK, we must have written that he must have written that in about 25 minutes in yeah, the studio it's always the way isn't yeah. it yeah and it was just like chords we didn't even have a bass line yet he wrote the song over the chords with a really simple kick drum he left we were messing around with the synth and just wrote the bass line the, the sort of really catchy donk, donkey bass line. Mm. And that was it. You know what Proper I mean? Proper donkey. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, cool. So in a scenario, right, with someone like him and EK, where he literally takes 20 minutes to put down something. Okay, so is that a, is that a, I think we can go, go to the pub now, guys. Was it, was it, is it, is it one of like, we know that this is, this is a bang, this is a banger. I think you can feel it when you're, when you're sort of, you can feel it when you're in the studio. Yeah. Um, and that's why it's so quick, I think, because there's, there's, I've written hundreds of songs that you have to spend a long time umming and ahhing, changing the lyrics, changing the melodies, mm. rewriting the chorus, whatever yeah. it is, and it's slowly sinking. And it's slowly yeah, sinking. Yeah. Exactly. The ones that just go like that are the ones that always end up being the best. And luckily, we've had that a few times. Um, but, you know, I say that, but then at the same time, you might write something you think is amazing and everyone else thinks it's rubbish. You know what I mean? Yeah. It happens all the time as yeah. well. You know, it happens every week with us. You know, we'll, we'll, and, you know, it's funny, like, Kai will make an idea and I'll be like, that's amazing. And then, you know, we'll play it to our management and they'll be like, right. they'll be like, that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> like, when's, where's the next one coming? You know what I mean? It's like everyone's got that different perception of what's good and what's, what's going to yeah. work. And So what's your batting average then? So if someone, you know you'll have different songs that are rolling out and let's call it 12, 13. How many, how many perceived bangers are there? How many do you think, you, you know, you know you're going to have to be answered by the management or the label? Like, what's the batting average yeah, of a it's, hit? It's, it's funny. I think it all depends on what era we're in. Yeah. <laughs> you know, 10 years of, of kind of wow. writing these songs. Like, I think... I think at the, at the beginning, because it was all so fresh and it was all so like experimental and we didn't really know what we were doing mm. and we were working with really interesting, like really pa like hungry sort of artists, people like Maverick Sabre. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, we were working with like Jennifer Hudson. Yeah. You know, she came JP over. JP Cooper as well, right? JP Cooper yeah. we worked with as well. Yeah. Um, and Jennifer just... Jennifer Hudson, wow. Yeah, she came over from America. Like it was, it was absolutely Surreal. bonkers. We yeah. ended up doing like touring with her out in the States, went on like American TV, went on Jimmy Kimmel with her, went on Dancing with the Stars, played live with her on there, like, you know, did, I think we did, um, what's the, the UK one? We did Top of the Pops with, you know, m and &E and all this stuff, like, it was proper, like, surreal. Wow. Um, and, you know, we never thought that, that those songs that we just made in our little studio in Finsbury Park would mm. get us there, but, you know, they did, and it sort of, um, I think, once we did that, we weren't too worried. We weren't too sort of worried about making loads more hits. Luckily, our label weren't like you know you've got to write more bangers, more more number ones, more yeah. more top tens because mm. they knew that our business was becoming a DJ business, playing out live. Yeah. You know? Once, I think once they saw that as well. Once they realised that deep down we're DJs, mm. we're, we're producers, but we're DJs. You know, we're club. We go to clubs and we, you know, play you know, hot dance music, like, mm. you know, whatever it is, rave music. Um, and that essentially is where, that's our business. That's mm. where we make money as well. So I think they, when they started to realise that, they they realised they could make money off us no matter whether we were making hits or not, mm. you know? Mm. So I think that's another reason why they didn't 
drop us, mm. you know, for years because, you know, we were bringing the money in for them, whether we were writing top 10 hits or whether we were, whether we were writing underground bangers. So we were mm. kind of just doing both. Yeah. So the whole time we weren't sitting down going, right, we've got to make a vocal banger today. We, you know, one day we'd be like, let's just make a, like a, di yeah. a dirty baseline yeah. garage tune, you know, mm. or, or like a, well, a sort of like weird dubstep tune or yeah. whatever it is, you know, because we love it. We love it all. So we can and we can make all of it because we both come from a, a long history of making tunes. Yeah. You know, and you listen to old FOMO tunes like he's made old dubstep tunes, old grime tunes. Just you know. relentless turnaround of music. Yeah, yeah. Career I was making worth. kind of grime stuff with yeah. weird jungly like elements and you know yeah. it's all that stuff and it's and we still do it to this day you yeah. know when i'm messing around on the plane on my laptop like i'm not just making house music i'm making weird like jungle and just a constant plug-in of finding the perfect yeah gene. just trying to just wow. experiment as well still it's it, I, mean, I get it because the, the, the whole urban nerds heg era that was very much that was very bass heavy you know, street culture level stuff. And it, for me, that particularly as an entry point you know, of, of, of a timeline, you could, you could Do throw anything. some dubstep yeah, in yeah. there, throw some, you know, if things sound a bit wobbly, bit, you know, Jack Beats each other. Because yeah, yeah, that was yeah. its time, wasn't it? Definitely, yeah. People like Jack Beats and Zinc and, you know, um, Crookers, all yeah. that sort of... The whole of bingo at, uh, yeah, label. Bingo, bingo beats, you know, that yeah. stuff was all very, like, what we were into. Zinc was a massive inspiration, like, mm. got us on, both on Rinse as well at the time when he was, he had a big, he was like a big part of Rinse at that mm. time. Um, I don't, he probably still is, I'm not sure, but he got us a show. We ended up having a weekly show on Rinse for, mm. like, four years or something. Yeah, yeah, wow. and then um And then we went to Kiss uh, a few years ago, did a few years with Kiss as well. So, yeah, we love... Radio, like, and I played pirate radio before that when I was a kid. When what I, pirate uh, radio did you do? Uh, I played on Time FM. Really? It was just like a sort of more of a garage thing. Nice. Um, and we actually set up our own little youth station as well at one point, which ended up playing like UK hip hop and, and, uh, and, and drum and bass oh, and nice. breaks and stuff. Did like a sort of youth community station. I was part of that. No, oh, you've really done it all. <laughs> it's all London based. Like it's uh, incredible. All growing up around you know North London, and we used to do loads of nights, you know, in like around Islington mm. and like Old Street. Mm -hmm. and, like I remember doing a regular night in uh, Clockwork, which was on um, just off Angel. That. That road oh, Upper Street. Pentonville Road. Pentonville Road. Yeah, yes, yeah. Yes. It was called Clockwork. It's called something else now. Mm -hmm. We used to do a regular night there. And yeah, like some of the people that I was doing it with then are, are doing what I'm doing now as well. So really? it's quite interesting. Yeah. A few all of my friends on the come right. up. Yeah. We all just carried on doing it. Some of them are, whether they're DJs or they're producers or they're A&Rs or they're, you know, working in the music industry. But yeah, it's funny. Like I had, we were a massive group of friends. Everyone was creative. Mm. You had like all the kind of more graph lot that were like, you know, the ATG guys, that was like a big thing, obviously. And then there were all the, like us lot, which were more the DJs and producers. Mm -hmm. And then we we sort of came together and started doing mm. raves, mm. ATG parties, mm. where it'd be like, it would be music, but mm. you know, there'd be a lot of graph. I think I played the carnival. That was the last one I did for Urban Nerds. Yeah. It's golden times really, you know, 2008, 2009, yeah. 10, 11. I've got an amazing old flyer of Urban Nerds ATG New Year's Eve and it's like headlined by Skepta and it's like <laughs> Skepta and I think it was like Navigator and Debt and like Rack and Ruin <laughs> Wow! and then like who else was on it I can't remember there was a bunch of other people on it but yeah it was just like those are the raves that we used to do you know yeah. and it was like a long yeah. time ago I can't speak can't lie the flyer yeah. is there <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay so moving on slightly brand brand um, value so, Gorgon City, in to, in most people's minds, is household so far as the songs that are being pumped in the radio. And yeah. when you guys do festivals, you really do, you go big. Um, how much of that are are you aware in terms of are you aware of in terms of brand expectation perception? You know, yeah. a far cry from you know. The, the, the more pirate related stuff. Yeah. There had to be a mind shift of taking it from 
you know, five to, to ten. Yeah. And pretty quickly. What's, yeah. what's your, what's your, what's your, what's your, what's your perception of the brand and how, how do you protect that at this point? Yeah, it's funny. It's, I think a lot of it's to do with sort of perception and what, and who you're talking to. Mm. Um, and also, yeah, it's like knowledge and sort of perception. Like, so people like you that knows the history, knows about FOMO and Rack and Ruin and knows about us making underground music mm-hmm. for years before mm-hmm. we even got to anywhere near these kind of stages, you know yeah. what I mean? So we can talk about this? I think, be- <laughs> I think people... <laughs> we can talk about I, this. I think people know. I think that that's for us. It's like, you know, the brand... That, that People can see that, you know, there's a lot more that, that's gone into it rather than just getting mm-hmm. signed to a major, get a hit record, go and play yeah. at Reading Blink Festival. Yeah, yeah, you're playing at Leeds and Reading, headlining the dance mm-hmm. stage, you know, you're on Radio mm-hmm. 1 playlist, mm-hmm. do you know what I mean? For some people, that's what they think that that happened with us because they might not be from London or they might not know anything about FOMO. They might know anything about yeah. like underground dance music from the UK or whatever. That's right. So, yeah, it's interesting because you basically yeah you 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 hear different kind of perceptions of us along along the road along the way. I've I've met a lot of people that you know re- that sort of give you that kudos or they don't basically, mm-hmm. and it's quite interesting. Why but, wouldn't they? Well, just because they might not really know about it and they might not, they might just think you're like a sort of commercial dance act. Because if someone had just heard Ready for Your Love with M&EK and maybe a couple of other songs from that first album. They might not know where it's come from. Yeah, they might yeah. just be like, oh, they're commercial, basically. Mm. And they won't be like, oh, they have roots in the underground. They have mm-hmm. longevity because they come from the underground. Because mm-hmm. there's so many acts, especially at the time when we first got signed, there were so many people doing the same kind of thing, mm-hmm. kind of copycat house music that was like you know, it might have a bass line, but essentially it was pop music yeah. um, that didn't last because they yeah. didn't have the... We're lucky that we had that foundation in mm. the underground and we'd been, you know, grinding for years, like, in the studio and in the clubs and in raves or mm. up and down the country. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we managed to kind of... I think that's one of the reasons why we managed to take the brand, you know, to the next level, but without really sort of... Tr- without trying to become commercial. Mm. Mm. We weren't like, oh my god! Like we have to make loads of top ten hits now. We need to appeal to the masses. Like mm. it just sort of happened. Like naturally, it felt like a sort of like a progression from making underground music to making music that was more popular, mm. that was more accessible, mm. and more kind of like vocal, less mm. less less big bass line, like bass lines, but mm. with vocals on top that mm. people could connect to. Trying to write write songs that people you know, could relate to and have a bit of meaning behind them. Because, yeah. like, with dance music, it's very easy, you know, to make a sort of generic club tune, Yeah. you know, that sort of has really basic lyrics about mm. dancing in the club or, yeah. you know... You hear them in the gym. It's have, just yeah, drinking a stuff, shot yeah. of yeah. tequila and dancing on the dance floor, something yeah, like that, yeah, do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. It's like we try to make... We always try to have a bit of integrity with it and just, like bit more kind of like deep meaning to mm. the songs and obviously a lot of them are very simple but we try and make sure that the vocals themselves and the lyrics themselves do have a bit of like you know meaning to them mm. are a bit interesting maybe a bit ambiguous you know what i mean like mm. just have a bit of depth you know what i mean simplicity is the hardest thing to yeah achieve isn't it yeah definitely if you can do a really good idea in a simple way and do it well then you're on to a winner, basically. That's, that's house production. That's house music. As a, house as a whole. music. A lot of dance music. Yeah. Drum and bass is the same. Like, it might sound fast, but yeah. if it's simple, bass line simple, little yeah. vocal sample, yeah. crazy sort of, like, jungle b- yeah. beats, like, it's all you need, really. Blade Runner is a bad yeah. boy producer. And yeah. now we do, just... Yeah, yeah. There's something about the, the recipe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like you say, I think... It's, it's difficult to do it. Right. But I definitely think, like, now we're at this level, <clears throat> it is interesting speaking to people when they really know the history. Like, mm. I don't want to sound like some, like, you know, sort of uh, music snob, because, like, mm. you know, I know there are genuinely amazing artists that do kind of blow up overnight, mm. and that's something which sure. is a lot more kind of common now because of the internet and because of, like, music software and mm. Spotify and everything. But I think it is interesting when you meet people who kind of know the history and they kind of like get it mm. and they're like, you know, oh, I used to listen to your old stuff. It's mm. nice. It's fun. It's 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 fun. It's fun. It's yeah, funny. Yeah, like yeah. everyone's like, you know, I've got your records when you were rack and ruin, or I've got FOMO records in my collection. Oh, you gotta love you that. Know, stuff you? like that. Yeah, it's fun. It's yeah. nice. It's nice. What's um, what was the most significant moment 
where you could say, oh, there's no turning back now. We have, you know, we've hit that moment of, or at least that stride where you've, you know, you, a certain headline in a certain place or a certain TV, must, any, you know, a number one hit that you were just like, oh, okay, I did not, okay, now we are going, you know, yeah, we're off yeah. to the races. Yeah, I think, I think it was probably when we, when we handed in our first album, like when we sort of finished it mm -hmm. and, they, and they like, you know, saw the track listing and, you know, you got the masters back. When we when I heard when we heard the first album in full, it was like wow, this is like, you know, it's turned into a proper like body mm. of work. Which at the time we were just writing songs, yeah, like yeah, we weren't yeah. planning on making an album really. Yeah, we did get signed, but we weren't really ready. We'd pretty much written the whole album before we'd even got signed in a way, mm. like because we were just having fun with it, mm -hmm. doing session. We had a great management team at the time, and like I said, there was so many other acts in the same world as us, yeah. Black Butter camp and everyone was coming up everyone was moving to london mm. it was like all these young singers and songwriters we we're all part of the same crew we go out partying every week basically <laughs> we party with them first you know on a wednesday in <laughs> shoreditch or whatever <laughs> and then first friday we'd be in the studio together right. and then we go out again that weekend you know it was like we right. party with them and then yeah, yeah. get in the studio and that was the connection it was friendships yeah. like we, were, we were creating friendships and you know just like friendships, a lot of them are friendships for life. Do you know? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we still yeah. work with some of them now. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, it's cool. It's wow. Cool. And they've all done incredible things, you know. Just coming from a stable where people can all relate, it's all relatable. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, yeah. It was a good time. Mm, yeah, I mean, it's that, that's what scenes are about, isn't it? You know, that's what it definitely, definitely. Scenes are, are what create, you know, art basically. Without, and that's a <laughs> that I don't want to sound like pessimistic, but that's what What's a lot missing. Of, that's what missing at yeah, the yeah. moment with yeah. the, with the sort of. I heard someone say to me the other day, the scene is in the screen now. Ooh. So, <laughs> or maybe he said the scene is on the screen. I can't remember. I don't know. You tell us. You guys are watching <laughs> on the screen. <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's like everyone's watching these songs, yeah. list, uh, it's discovering music for a phone and like, you know, you might have a million hits on a TikTok post, yeah. but, uh, and, but those people aren't coming to see you play. They're, no. in, they're in like wherever. Yeah. They're not in a scene, you know, but we, we all we all brought, we all created scenes by real friendships and, yeah. and real physical kind of like club yeah, yeah. nights. Just being together. Yeah. Because it's safety in numbers, it's security yeah. to, the, to the growth of Yeah, you build genre something together all, yeah. and then like they, you tell his friend, it's all word of mouth, like yeah. everyone tells their friends, brings their friends yeah. to the next one, it gets bigger and bigger. Is that bleak? Uh, I just feel like there's going to be those guys, those, those, those crews of people who will still do it. Yeah and cr create scenes in the way that we used to yeah. and sort of fight back against the, the mm. sort of TikTok culture that we're in now because that's what happens, isn't it? Mm. You, you rebel against what's, what's kind of happening in mm. a way when you're, when you're in underground culture. Mm. You don't want to do what all the other people are doing. No. I feel like if I was 13, 14 now, I'd be like, I don't want to be on TikTok. I yeah. want to be on like... I yeah. want to be doing a club night in some underground tunnel, like in a in a in a in, a, in South yeah, London, yeah. or do you know what I mean? Like, do you feel like a false sense of alignment for for Gorgon City having to, you know, appease that that direction in which people's attention goes? I think every I think everyone, a lot of people who are who are sort of who've been doing it for a while, like me, feel like now we're being forced to do things that we never signed up for. Right. Do you know right. what I mean? Yeah, like of things course. Being, being fully focused on yeah. socials and rather than being in the studio, you know. Yeah. The fact that you put up your new tune on a, on a social post and it does a third of what you do if you put a photo up of you and a dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, yeah. Just, it's, just, it's just the way it is. Um, and so that is a bit difficult, but... You've just got to adapt, isn't it? And that's the thing, yeah. you do, you do have to adapt. You do, but it's interesting talking to you about it because, you know, arguably, um, depending on when you're watching this, uh, Gorgon City is at the precipice of what's going on and the relevance of the, the name and the brand. And if you're saying that, then, you know, hell hath no fury for the young people <laughs> that, are just, that are just following suit, presuming that, you know, brands of such status within the music are, are, are leading by example when you're saying, well, no, actually, it's not. It's not the case. Yeah, I think also it depends on what kind of personality you have and what and what sort of um, what kind of brand you have as well. What mm. kind of image you have and what kind of uh, how you communicate with your audience. You know, mm. like we kind of. 
think we're kind of like we're just sort of in between. We're kind of we're not bad at it, mm. but we're not good at it. It's mm. sort of like we're just like you're in the middle. We're in the middle. We're trying to do it. Mm. Kai's really good at. It. He's really funny. He's really good on socials. Mm. It's like I want him to do more, yeah, but yeah, yeah. it's like I don't. I don't really feel comfortable trying to be like funny online. There's a lot of other artists that are similar to us that are in a similar world, but mm. they're really good at their socials, you know, mm. and they'll have, you know, triple, double the amount of followers that yeah. like we have or something because, but their tunes might not do as, as well as ours. Do you know it's what I mean? It's a lane, isn't it? It's, it's one more or other. In a way, yeah. I mean, mm. if you can do both, then you're onto a winner mm. and there are some people that can. And, you know, some some people, hopefully, the music can speak for itself. That's the thing. Mm. Back in the day, the music spoke for itself, basically. Yeah. Now it doesn't so much. You can make the best tune in the world, but if you don't have a, an image behind it yeah. or a marketing like, idea, yeah. then the, the, you won't get signed. You won't get signed to a major. No, no, that's the thing, because it's all about it's perception about, of front, front, yeah. what's on the front And end. you can make that... Can build that audience yourself before you get signed. Mm. I mean, all the MC, all the grime MCs and like rappers and stuff, they're doing it the best mm. way because they're they're building their whole world before labels get involved. True. And then the label gets involved, and then they're like, "Yeah, you got, I'll you sign me, give me the money, I'll set mm. up my own label and own it." Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can take a little bit. I forget, yeah, that's <laughs> you know right. I mean? Yeah, and that's what they've all done, and it's it's amazing to what to see that as someone who's been on a major label deal for so long mm. to see these young kind of rappers and. They're like entrepreneurs, do you know what I mean? Yeah. They're doing it in a way which is very, which is very powerful. They're yeah. bringing the power back into the artist's hands, which is, which is amazing. So that in that in that way, social media and all that stuff is mm. it can be an amazing thing for an artist. But if you're not that type of artist, it can be very difficult. Depends what it, yeah, yeah. You know I mean, I guess every producer has this idealism of like, I don't know, being as, you know, I don't know. Like your pendulums or your your Ivy Labs or your um, yeah, sort of like know, behind so, the scenes a little yeah, bit. Yeah, a little bit kind of ghostly and like yeah, some, yeah. these enigmas. Of, that's of, what that's why I start, That's what I signed up for. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> and now the spray can to yeah, behind yeah, the boards. Yeah, exactly. Sort of being inconspicuous. In, yeah. You know, I never knew what any of my favorite DJs looked like mm. until like until recently because mm. they started having social media. You yeah, that, I mean? that's bonkers in itself, isn't it? Yeah, I never knew what like. You know, Jumping Jack Frost looked like, or, or even Sasha, or yeah, you know, yeah, anyone, he, anyone, yeah, yeah. These, these, you know, there was it was such a distant time. You didn't even and see them in the corner. There'd be no lights on them. Yeah, yeah. That's another thing. Yeah. Now you go and play a set, yeah. and there's massive bright lights on you. Yeah. With fire, you know, all this crazy pyro and big screens behind yeah. you. You're brighter than the audience is. Yeah. How much do you have involvement in scenarios like? Because you guys have a lot of pyrotechnic. <laughs> yeah. Like you have a lot of pyrotechnic. <laughs> uh, it's uh, more like that's the club that will sort that out. But okay. we 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 create our own sort of visuals, visuals and yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah. So we've done. So that. you do that behind the scenes we as well. Build that. Yeah, we build it. We do it with alongside designers. So mm. we've. We've always done that since the beginning. Worked with some really amazing people over the years. Um, this guy called Tom Wall, he's, he's absolutely amazing at creating worlds mm. just out of his head, <laughs> like on the computer using graphic technology. I, I love know, those I, guys. I know, I don't know how. How? That's yeah. the thing. I, was always, I always said, like, if I didn't make tunes, I'd love to learn how to, mm. like, make visuals because I don't know what they're doing. But how can you be a good cook as well? Are you a good cook? <laughs> I'm all right. Yeah, man, I'm producers okay. are always good cooks. <laughs> yeah. Kai's a good cook as well, actually. Really? He makes banging hot sauce and stuff. Really? Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. But, um, yeah, I think that w that sort of, like, big spectacle of, of being a DJ now is, is very different to how it was when I, when I first started. And yeah. you just have to adapt, and it's what people want. It's what sells tickets. Mm. It's, what, it's what the crowd mm. expects now. They expect... You know, they turn up to a rave. They don't expect just a little... Unless they're, like, going to an underground night, which is, mm. like, what, you know, in Berlin or mm. in Amsterdam or in London, like, something yeah. more underground. You know, if they go into a big club, like, they expect a big screen, yes. massive sound system, yeah. pyro, CO2, yeah. confetti, all yeah. of it. They just what they expect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've got... You have to do it. It's part of, like, the sort of precedent now. Yeah, and it is, isn't it? It's sort of, like... It's not, you know, it, it might not look cool to some people. No, it looks and it, great. I mean, it looks great on the eyes, but, you know, it can, it can be a bit overkill. I think, you know, the whole sort of, like, superstar DJ thing, you know, started in the, like, late 90s, I guess, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, with all the IB first, right. lot, Fatboy Slim and all those people. Yeah. Um, that's Todd, not Todd what, Terry. Todd, like yeah, it. that's not what, what we were mm. really doing because mm. it was like we were, make, we were doing mm. underground. That's way cooler than that. Still is. Well, yeah. yeah. But we're trying to basically we're still trying to keep that vibe alive mm. in our music. Gotcha. Um, our next track is actually 
uh, got a old London club in the title in the track in the track title, and it's going to be coming out in January. And Can we reveal that name? Uh, this is coming out in two weeks. I'll time. Say, no, oh right, no, yeah. uh, it's it's got the best club in King's Cross in the name, basically. Nice. From back in the day, I'll oh, say that. Come on, but, right. um, but we'll, but we're gonna, you know, it's got lots of old Amazing. sounds in there, which are from that era. It's got a vocal in there, like from a rave, like fantastic. And you know, we're trying to, especially now that we're, you know, going to be releasing sort of independently for a bit, and like be doing our own thing. A lot of the tunes are going to be a bit, a lot, a lot more kind of like, mm. you know, in the to the un- point, to of, the point yeah. of what we we're, what we we're originally about. That's and we so have nice. written songs over the years that like. Looking back, like yeah. they weren't really what we're about, you know. Like there are certain tracks that it's not like we regret, we regret releasing no. them, but some of them might be a bit, you know. Hindsight's a great, you mm-hmm. know, hindsight's a powerful thing. Mm-hmm. Like sometimes you're like, oh, that tune wasn't really quite right. Of course, you know what I mean, <laughs> happens a lot. <laughs> so yeah, there's a few like that. There's some carpet cutters in my collection. Yeah. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> um, on that note, is there anything? significant which we you could say for you know the the excessive highs and um huge you know endorphin moments that of of a career as you know to a current state of where you're at now so anything where you can look back and say to yourself wow man i didn't understand if someone said to me that would be a pitfall something always suffers yeah yeah for you sure know, what what would you say from a it doesn't have to be personal but in a broader sense if if you prefer but what what suffers? What is the ultimate? What's the, what's the thing you you kind of? Yeah, I mean, I always you know what goes up must come down, right? But mm. and there's always, you know there's no highs without lows. But I feel like you can you know survive and sort of do it on that sort of endorphin based like high for a while mm. and sort of get you know wherever you're on the tour bus. Or you're, you know, in and in and out of festivals every day, mm-hmm. and you're just constantly just bang, 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 and you're, mm. you're drinking, you're partying, mm. you're going to these crazy after parties, and you know, everyone's doing the same thing as you, so you think it's okay. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah. And it, um, you know, for a while it's good, but I think you have to get to a point where you've got to start like assessing whether it's affecting your life badly or your studio work and stuff like that. You know, if it. You How just, do you stop it if you are already on that train? Well, yeah, it's not that's, it's not that's easy. Not nice. That's the thing. It's basically you've just got to be really, really sort of um, sensible and disciplined about certain things. I mean, I went through many years of just like, you know, not caring and just going for it. And also when you're a, when you're a bit younger, you can get up on a Monday and go to the studio after a big weekend. You can. I mean, we did countless studio sessions, you know, mm. hungover, you know, jet lags in, yeah. in LA like after you know a f- two hours sleep still yeah. having, still still go in and write a song with someone and you know f- sort of force it out of you mm. Red Bull coffee mm. you know whatever it is to get you through it yeah um, that was good f- okay for a while but yeah you, nowadays got to be careful and definitely me and Kai have like you know we tour in a very different way to the way we used to okay funniest tour story <laughs> funniest tour story uh, ever uh, Oh, yeah, now you're in trouble. Uh, God, there's a lot of ridiculous situations that we've been in. <laughs> um, God, I don't know, man. I'll tell you one thing. One of one of Kai's birthdays when we were young, when we were first started out in San Diego. I'm not even going to go into detail because it was that ridiculous. But everyone will know who was there. <laughs> that was ridiculous. But yeah, we've just had mad, mad tour, tour stories about doing crazy shows. So we did one of the first ever DJ sets. I think it was the first ever DJ set on a, on a, on a transatlantic flight. So on Virgin Atlantic, we did a, the inaugural flight from London to Atlanta from Gatwick on a new type of aircraft called like a Dreamliner. This was a few right. years ago. And we played on it, DJed as we were going over the Atlantic. Stop it. Yeah, and all the cabin crew were there partying on us. We had a sound system on the plane and it was a party the whole way. I have never heard of anything yeah, like yeah, that. It was that's amazing. So that's one of the that was one of our highlights of like of my career. Just the most random place yeah. to be DJ'd basically. Yeah. That playing on top of a there's a thing called Circle, which is like an online kind of like video set uh, music session thing. We DJ'd on a cliff on like overhanging this massive cliff in Croatia. No. Yeah, with like a it's called like a skywalk with like a, a see through bottom. That ain't me, like, pal. That yeah, ain't me. <laughs> so wow. those those kind of things, you know, 
And just like flying straight from, um, you know, doing mad stuff like flying straight from coach. We got invited from, by Pete Tong to go and play with him in Vegas straight after Coachella. So we finished our site in Coachella. He came and picked us up, drove straight to the airport, got on a private jet with, with Pete Tong, flew to Vegas, DJed with him, and then went back to Coachella the next day. Stop. Those it. kind of things were, you know, were like sort of pinch me moments. Like, what the fuck is going on here? Like, we are, you know, we're just like two kids from London, just like you know making beats <laughs> so little things like that momentum is the cause of things like that it's it really is isn't it? i think so hard work yeah. non-stop sort of that's the, that's another thing about like longevity like being able to make sure that you can make those studio sessions after a big weekend yeah and my mate said the other day the one th- the one skill you need being a dj is being able to sleep upright on a play on an airplane <laughs> That's literally, if you could do that, you can be a touring yeah, DJ. Because yeah, yeah. that's, you don't sleep. No. So you're just always, you're always on a plane or yeah. you're in a club. Yeah. So yeah, learn how to sleep on a plane. I'm not very good at it still. <laughs> Must but, be yeah. quite liberating having the freedom now after such a long time signed. Yeah, man. I'm really excited. It's literally just happened. So yeah, January will well, be Congratulations. Off. Nice one. Yeah. Thank you very much. Richly deserved. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're in a new chapter. Yeah. Mr. Rackaroon, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, brother. Big up. Big up, Gorgon City. Big up, big up, Kai. Um, and yeah, roll on. Street Culture Podcast, I like that. Thank you so much for joining us. Hope you enjoyed it. Till next time, stay lucky, people. Easy. <laughs>